Okay, I want to talk about the distribution of sizes of fuel drops and a, a needle metered carb, which is the typical carb that we most of us have. Even electron or a smart carb is uh, metered by a needle. So if you look at this picture out here, you can see that there's large droplets, medium sized droplets, and very small ones, and probably beyond that, vapor. This is my page on the subject. Right here is the, the direction. I'm talking about this subject because I think it might be of use to some people. In regards to engine heat and um, lower bearing lubrication. So I explain myself pretty well on this page, telling what the different size droplets are for, how they're formed, etc. And even giving an example. There's someone that has a uh, CR500, and he said on the forum that he uh, recently seized the low end bearings, and I chatted with him, and he gave me the specs, and on my oil ratio calculator, he was down like 14% on the, the average correct ratio for the the specs on his engine and the specs on the oil that he was using. So I, I generally don't think being 14% low on the oil ratio or on the amount of oil he should be adding is going to destroy the bearings. I know bearings don't last forever, but to, to seize, to get loose is what happens when they get old. But to seize, that's a heat problem, okay? Why did those bearings get so hot? Probably because they weren't getting enough lubrication. So, looking at his, his situation, um, he was using a carburetor that it, it was set up to have a, a low percent delivery of large fuel droplets. I presented this idea on a couple of forums and there was some opposition, of course, and that, that's, that's good to be expected. That helps to make sure that you're on the right path, covering all negative possibilities. So one person said, it, it can't be true because uh, fuel-injected bikes don't have big fuel droplets. And, and they don't overheat, and they don't have bearing problems. And so I looked it up and I found a, one study that said when the, the injectors is open or, you know, for wide open use, you know, full throttle use, it does produce some large fuel droplets. So um, that kind of shoots down that argument. So what we have going on here is that... Um, we have these factors out here that that control the amount of atomization that happens with the fuel. When the fuel first comes up, it has kind of an upward trajectory out, out here, and then it's carried by the air and becomes more and more horizontal. And from here to the engine is is space in which that those fuel drops are accelerating. They're being pushed along by the air. And they don't immediately assume the same velocity as the air. It takes a while for them to accelerate. The distance that happens is, is probably, from my experiments and uh, estimation, probably about five inches maximum. Within five inches, well, it depends upon the air velocity and the fuel volatility, but just kind of an, an average. So, the, the shorter the distance from that needle to the engine, the, the shorter 
time the air has to work on the fuel droplets to reduce their size. What happens, the air is blasting past these droplets, okay, and it, and it goes along the sides of them, and it, it pulls off some of the fuel. So it's actually shearing off some of the fuel from those droplets. And so the, the large, the medium, and the small are all becoming smaller, little by little. The volatility of the fuel, you know, when you, when you take the, the gas cap off of a, of a container of fuel, it releases air pressure. That air pressure happens because um, the, the, there's a certain percentage of the fuel that's vaporizing just from the, 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 the heat that it's experiencing, you know, if you don't keep it on ice. And so um, that, that, va that natural vaporization is what we refer to as volatility or in instability. And there's a way to measure that. If you put uh, so much fuel, if you have a container and one one fifth of it is filled with fuel, and it was brought down to a certain temperature. I don't remember what that is, like 40 degrees, something like that. And then you seal that container and you put a, a pressure gauge on it, and you heat that fuel up to 100 degrees. The the psi that it reads is the called the Reed vapor pressure number. Okay. And that's a gauge of the volatility. The, the more fuel that vaporizes with the heat of that 100 degrees, the more pressure you have in the cylinder. And the, so what happens is that the older your gas is, you know, you get gas hanging around in the, in the garage, you, you have gas in the bike and you haven't used it for a month. The older it is, the less volatile that fuel is. And that, that means that it's less capable of being reduced, of, of being atomized, okay? So that's one of the, the factors involved here. So you got the air velocity, the fuel volatility, the clearance between the needle and the needle jet. The needle jet is the, the hole that the needle slides in and out of, okay? So that clearance is like, um, a nozzle size, basically. The bigger that clearance is, the more likely big droplets are going to come out initially. And then, of course, the rate of fuel flow. If you have a really fast fuel flow, it's, it, it's immediately going to produce less large fuel droplets. Okay. So those, those are the few, the, the four factors that I think are the most important as far as atomization. So what happens is that you have your fuel droplets, uh, the vapor, the small, the medium, the large, they're all being sucked into the engine and they've been accelerated up to the speed of the air. Okay, and, and so the piston's are going up and so the piston's producing a vacuum here. This is the, the vacuum here that these that the air and the fuel have to, to fill to, to, uh, to move into that space. So it's got, a, it's got a, a curved path that it takes, okay? So those fuel droplets are going through a curve, okay? And you know, like you ride a bike or you drive a car, God forbid, and you go through a turn, you feel the, the centrifugal force, the outward force, okay? Away from the, the, the center of the, of the radius of the turn. Same thing happens with the little droplets. So what I think is happening is that the large droplets do not make that turn. And they wind up hitting the piston. Either in the high, the medium, the low, or even if they're really large, they won't even go that far, and they'll just drop right down. Okay. Um, when the piston get clears more, it's they're going to be hitting the the cylinder wall right here. Okay. So all the other fuel 
except for what randomly touches the metal as a result of turbulence is not absorbing any of the heat of the engine. It's the large fuel drops, droplets that absorb that heat. And so basically they have a cooling effect, okay? That's one reason racers prefer large carbs is because they get more of the large fuel droplets because of the lower air velocity and they get more cooling. And also they get more lubrication to the bearings. How does that happen? From touching the piston, the cylinder wall, it drools down. There's a little hole right over the, the, the casing around the, the bearing. That hole goes right to the bearing. Okay? So those two crank bearings really depend upon what is drooling down and carrying the oil to them. And the, the rod bearings just, they get oil as a result of the, the turbulence. Just the other droplets being thrown around. So, of course, with any idea, you have to test it. Okay, I know that. You know that. Everyone knows that. You gotta test it. Everyone thought the masks were a good idea for COVID. Well, guess what? The scientists tested it after COVID started, and guess what? Every test in a live situation said they do nothing. Okay? The tests prove the ideas or disprove the ideas. Okay, so these are three graphs for my jetting and calculator. And you can barely see the, the blue line because it's most of it's behind the red line. This carb is jetted so good. The red line indicates perfect jetting from one eighth uh, slide open to wide open throttle. And the more that blue line is, is uh, equal to the red line, the more perfect the jetting is, okay? And of course, with a race bike, you can make that bow up a little bit to be more rich. Above the red line is rich, below the red line is lean, okay? But for a street bike, following the red line is perfect. So, um, the first two are with the Ford D8 needle on my VM18 card. And it's, it's a lean needle. It's, it's only a one degree uh, taper angle. And then the third graph is of the 4F15 needle, which is a one and a half degree. So a wide open throttle, there's going to be more clearance between the needle and the needle jet is going to be skinnier there because of the 1.5 degree, skinnier than the 1 degree. Okay, so that it's going to allow more large fuel droplets, according to Michael's theory. Okay, it's just an idea. Let's, let's see if the idea has any, any meat to it. So the, the first two are the 48 needle, and it, this one's with the number 70 main jet, and this one's with the number 75 main jet. The little notes are right here. This one gives the richest jetting, okay? The, the number involved of the, of the richness on the, in the jetting calculator is 10.46. This is 10.14, which is 3% less. And this is 10.3, which is 2% less. Okay? If there's no, this, none of this fuel drop of malarkey happening, and we're just going by the, the jetting, the richest should be the coolest because you have more fuel going in there to cool the engine. But in my test, it wasn't. So the coolest was this one right here. Amongst these two, the coolest, yes, was, was the richest one because of the bigger main jet. But when you go to the 48, the 4F15, the, the coolest became the leanest one which doesn't make sense, okay, unless there's something else going on, which is affecting the engine um, heat. Not a big difference between the two, like 10 degrees difference, okay? But the richest jetted one was the hottest, was hotter 
in the 2% leaner jetted one. You know, I need to do some more testing. You know, one, one test is not going to be the end all. But it's a step in, in that direction to, to prove the theory. So, on my jetting calculator, which covers Makuni, VM, TM, uh, Makuni, TMX, TMS, all the Keyhines, all the Del Ortos, and then it's got to shoot for any other strange card you might want to, to measure. If you look right over here, uh, if you can follow my, my cursor right here, this one says 20%. And my formula to calculate that percent of large fuel drop, this is not exact. There's no way in hell I can measure that. So I'm just using it as a reference point. You go from one to another, one setup to another setup, and you look at that percentage, and you look at how much they differ between each other, okay? Um, so this TMX shows 12.3%. Oh my gosh. It's got less percentage of large fuel drops. Okay, so th that's how I'm telling people to, to use that, that calculation. Just as a point of comparison between different setups. If you're racing, you're dealing with you know, the heat. You know, that's, that's a, a real biggie when it comes to racing. The engine gets too hot, it's going to lose power. Why? Because I think too much vapor, hot vapor, is being produced as a result of large fuel droplets vaporizing when they touch the metal. And that hot vapor expands and it it pushes out it, it occupies some of the space that otherwise the, the normal fuel droplets in the air would occupy and the normal fuel droplets carry much more fuel than the vapor does and so that's where you get the power loss okay that jetting calculator is not the only one I sell I've got a whole set of calculators, expansion chamber, crank balance, jetting, porting, squish, boost bottle, fuel oil ratio, carburetor size, and the whole set of right now is only $70. But some people do not like using a computer and they've never used a spreadsheet. They don't understand that spreadsheets can be made to be very, very, very user-friendly. On mine, all the data entry, entry cells are in light blue. Like this right here is asking for the, the model of the card. And so you just click onto the cell, type in the answer, and hit enter. And right here is asking for the size of the carburetor, do the same, click on it, type in, enter. That's all you do. You just enter the information it wants and it shows you the results. Okay? You look and see it's, it, the whole thing's lean right now. So, my spreadsheets are very user friendly. But if you don't want to use them, you don't have Excel, you don't want to buy Excel, you don't want to mess with it, if you give me all the data that any one of these spreadsheets wants for a fee, I will do the calculations for you and tell you the results and add along with that my two cents worth for my experience. Okay? If you look right here, this is my email. And this is my telephone, but don't call me. Only if you have trouble paying or you pay and I, I don't see your payment and I haven't sent the software to you. Otherwise, you're not using that telephone number because I have to pay for the call. And it's a, it's a forwarded call from USA to Ecuador where I'm at. 
You want to talk to me? Talk to me on email. That's my email right there. And so, my friends, this ends the latest chapters in the ongoing evolution of discovery of two-stroke technology. Thanks for watching.